thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, we've got a really fun webinar here for you guys today. We're going to be talking about access control and how to strengthen your cybersecurity for HIPAA compliance. Um, thank you again, everybody. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A section. Um, we will be reviewing those, um, and Harris, uh, on my team here, will uh, pipe in and let us know uh, questions along the way, maybe at, and probably at the end. But um, if there's anything that's pressing, we'll uh, he'll jump in and let us know. Um, let's see here. This program is educational and does not con constitute or may not be construed as legal or tax advice. Um, materials we reference here are subject to change and frequently do so. So make sure you're reviewing those items. So um, here I am. If you guys don't know me, I think a lot of folks here are, are seeing, you know, have been coming to our webinars here, and we do appreciate that. My name is Jason Carr, and I'm the Chief Compliance Officer over here. Uh, I won't read my bio to you, but I'll read uh, our two uh, guests here. I'll do spend a little more time with them. But if you have any specific questions about HIPAA, um, just feel free to reach out to us here at Total HIPAA. Um, and the info at TotalHIPAA.com is the best way to reach us. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, let's see here. Um, so our first guest here, this is Garrett Grayjack. He's from the CEO over at UATS. We're really uh, glad to have him here. I think it's going to be a Really interesting to look at, uh, talk about his products and some things that uh, that what he does. So as you can see, he's a certified security engineer and product builder. Um, he's got over 25 years of IT uh, security and product creation experience. And um, I just saw this. He has 15 US patents for information security products. That's pretty cool. Um, so we're really excited to have you here. And uh, thank you, uh, Garrett, for joining us. Um, and our next guest here is um, Ashley Madison. Um, she's the Director of Customer Success, and she's going to help us with some stories that she's got coming up here. Um, and so, as you can see, she handles the customer support issues and runs a quarterly business review with them. Um, so if you guys have any questions about you attest, um, just so you can reach out to them directly, or if you send questions our way, we can also help uh, direct you guys over there. Um, but we're really excited to talk about some access control. I know that's not uh, everybody's favorite uh, necessarily topic to be yes, talking about. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> that's right. Just went for a barbecue this weekend, and that's all people said. They, they weren't even <laughs> IT people. They said, Garrett, you know about access control. Let's talk. It, you know, it's one of those things, it's maybe not the sexiest topic, but it's one of those things that is so important. And especially because, you know, I think we'll talk about this a lot is your users and your, your workforce are your weakest link. And so you've got to really keep track of who has access and to what. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So just a little bit of background, guys. Um, with the HIPAA safeguard standards, we have three things that we're looking at mainly. Now there's a lot more sub controls that happen with this, but we're looking at administratively what is going on. So we gotta make sure we have those policies and procedures that we've done the risk assessment, that we know administratively what's going on. Physically, who has physical access, um, that's a little different these days with, uh, with COVID. Um, you know, we used to talk a lot more about physical site access that may or may not be a concern for folks today. Um, but really about physical access to devices is important. Um, and then technical, which is I think we're going to be focusing a lot more with our, our guests here with you, from UATest, is really about how are we granting and denying access from a technical standpoint. Um, so I think three really important questions is, what are you protecting? And have you identified what information you have and who has access to it? Um, how are you protecting physical access and how are you protecting technical access? So these are all things we're going to be going into today. So getting started here is um, limiting information system access to authorized users. And this is not only as users, but processes acting on behalf of users and devices. So Garrett and Ashley, thank you again for joining us. Maybe we want to talk a little bit about some things that, um, you know, ways that people can limit access and maybe ways that people, you know, where people have access or may have granted access that they haven't thought about it. Let, let's, let's start back. Okay. It, okay. It was, there's a great topic that you brought up and I love it because that's what triggers my mind and it triggers everyone's mind. It's access control. Let's define access control, y'all. Okay. When, when we all... Okay. 
started, you know, 20, 30 years ago, not you all, but I certainly me, uh, 20, 30 years ago, right? You're, there's concept of green screens, concept of mainframes, and people, as a security guy, they're pretty good, okay? <laughs> Let's not knock it. And there's a reason why mainframes still exist, right? Mm -hmm. Central point of access, some of the best RBAC control in the world ever written is the mainframes, okay? Because they literally solved everything that we're trying to solve today. They went down to RBAC, not just at the access level, but at what, what we're really struggling today at the data level. That's what the mainframes gave us, okay? Right. But we all know that wasn't scalable and it's really hard to carry a mainframe, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> so we we erred on the side of of practicality. And that is why we exist as IT people, right? Just to say, hey Garrett, that's great technology, but get that in a laptop, right? Get that in a mobile phone, get that in my wristwatch, okay? Right. And what that did is decentralize. Decentralize everything, not just the devices, guys, but decentralize the data, where the data is held, right? Mm -hmm. And the, where the access is. Okay. So, Garrett, if if the real problem spelled out in something which I always call out in this 853, which is, you know, the cybersecurity framework, which everything else is based on, I don't care if it's HIPAA, I don't care if it's high trust, I don't care if it's uh, CMMC, it all mm -hmm. goes back to NIST 853. It states out straight out, and if you read 853, it's pretty well written. I mean, this mean, is pretty good. I had a, a, the fortune to present to them in my career and had nothing but great respect for the gentleman and the, and the people in, in general that worked there. And it was just a learned conversation. And if you read what they did, it's not about devices. It's not about the cloud. It's not, it's just saying, Hey, if you got a resource, and they don't care, care and I love the way uh, um, Jason speaks here. They don't care if it's a door. They don't care if it's a you know uh, the lunch menu, and they don't care if it's a cloud app or or, or something from CERN or Epic. What they care mm -hmm. about is that you you understand what the data is, right? Mm -hmm. Who is getting access? And here's the real hard one, y'all: why they're getting access? Yeah, because. The person who gave access, right, knows why mm -hmm. they give it. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. he documented that. <laughs> right. <Does it? laughs> right? And and Total HIPAA is, is that company that's that you guys go to and say, hey, Total HIPAA, you know, um, I just I, I'm I'm you know, I'm offering this uh this this content, this service, this this product, this this drug, and now I fall under uh HIPAA guidelines. Uh what do I have to uh what do I have to do? <laughs> And that's why Jason intelligently started off with access control, right? Yeah. Because you have to quantify what you got and then you have to quantify how you're giving access. Like I said, it doesn't matter if it's a door, a lunch menu or a cloud app, you have to quantify what, what it is. And then you have to answer that really hard question, why? <laughs> why mm -hmm. did you give access to? You know, because Bob, who's running your Octa or your Zero AD or your Jump Cloud server, he knows why he gave access, but how is that documented? Okay, so that's when when I think about access controls in HIPAA, I I I, you know, HIPAA's great and it was good. It was one of the earlier ones, and it, it said straight out, and there, there's fines around it. But we just did a webinar, Ashley and I, where I quantified. Guys, fines is the least of our problem. If you if you go down the, the things, HIPAA does fines. And once you have fines, that's usually you've already had some IP or financial or more importantly, PHI get out. And then that mm -hmm. means customer data. And then that means what, y'all? That means that we have lost the reputation, integrity, and the confidence of our organization. And that spells stock and sometimes collapse of companies. So it starts with the HIPAA fines, and by this time, the industry is almost grateful to have some type of guidelines around it to say, okay, this is what I've done, and not saying we're all going to be, be breached, but we have to think of it as almost inevitable, right? What are the standards and practices, the practices and with procedures we did to avoid mm -hmm. getting breached? And that's yeah. what... That's why companies like Total HIPAA exist to help you quantify and to show evidence that you actually did do the practice and procedures. Okay. Right. And, 
And, yeah. and one thing I want to bring up here, and I think is really important in this discussion is, you know, if you are not doing things like your HIPAA policies and procedures and you have that breach and we have to notify, you know, first you have to notify the, the patients or the, the uh, clients that are whose data you're holding, but you have to expect, and this comes from the Poneman Institute, that you're going to lose about 60% of your of your client base from that situation. Yes. So I, I so love you, it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we all can cite identity companies that we've also, and it, it affects their stock prices, and it's serious. Mm -hmm. it, it is, none of us are immune. And this right. is something I just read the other day. Do not think you're immune if you're because, Garrett, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not Anthem, who I'm a healthcare member of, they're wonderful, all that kind of stuff. I'm not, you know, Blue Cross, whatever. I'm just 100 people. Okay, y'all, if anybody y'all run a scanner, scanners don't care. They don't mm -hmm. care what size of company you are. They're just scanning to see whether someone hasn't patched X. Right, right. So, so right. you just scan everything, and voila! You just happen to hit a Windows 10 machine that is, you know, mm -hmm. has this vulnerability. Rock and roll. Let me get my Metasploit go and download this, and then I'll figure out who the hell I'm on. <laughs> and if, if we don't think that, I get it. There is the whole cyber kill chain where people do a reconnaissance first and they target whatever. But a lot of hacking is straight out vulnerabilities. Straight out that that you know there's some company out there and who knows what I can get out of it. I'll get my machine on there. I'll you know pull the AD. I'll pull the PAM. I'll I'll get onto the uh, the the uh, system level accounts and then I'll go see what kind of data I can steal. You know, so yes. Yeah. Well, I think that brings up the next co of the conversation is does every employee need to have the same access? Does every user that go that goes in? And that's one of the things I think NIST does a really nice job with is saying okay, we need to actually, when we grant access, we should be granting at the low, we should basically be granting the least amount of access to start with and then grant additional privileges as needed. So not everybody like your receptionist, uh, maybe not, you know, not your nurses, some of the, you know, if you're in a medical practice or if you're an insurance agent uh, or an employer, you know, employer group is just thinking about what, who needs to really have this access and, and thinking about how we restrict that. And that's one of the things I think we need to make sure is on there. Um, and then from HIPAA standpoint, they always talk about minimum necessary. So what's the least amount of access or minimum amount of access required to do the job? So I, I and I'm going to throw Joel, uh, Ashley into this conversation, but and for those keeping track, that's NIST PRAC-6. That's the principle of least privilege. And that mm -hmm. really is the default finding control when it comes to the companies that we work with and the companies in general that say, hey, and this is what I'm throwing actually on this one, because we have companies that if I ask the CISO, what regulatory compliance are you doing for? They'll get offended. They'll look at me and say, why did you ask me that? I, I know I need to be secure. Let's get on with it. Let's see how to use your tool. Okay. So Ashley, if you want to talk about any of our customers and how they, they use the, the product, not just for guidances, but actually to, to review the users and access. Well, yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's one customer in particular that I'm thinking of, and we just did a video on LinkedIn about it. Um, he's talking about just rubber stamping everything, right? So, you know, a lot of people just go through the motions of, yes, this person has access to this, this person does not have access to this. And they're just literally just rubber stamping, like check mark, done, 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 done. But are they really looking into why does this person have access to this? And why does this person have access to this? You really need to go dig deeper and not just rubber stamp everything. And he goes further to, because he's in the cybersecurity field. So he goes on further to talk about how he was previous to using our tool previously it was taking so much time to go through what users have access to what and so now he's able to do more of you know his daytime job his real job of how can we prevent hacks um so that's that's one use case that we have with a particular customer of how they use a tool such as ours yeah like you said because 65 percent of attacks start with identities guys so, mm -hmm. and, and that's going to go up. And we all yeah. know that's going to go up because the cloud is nothing but identities. 
That's all it is. What is <laughs> what is the firewall for the cloud, right? I mean, that's it's, it's a silly concept, Garrison. You're, you're letting in uh, port 443. That's your firewall, right? Right? And what's your packet inspection? There's no packet inspection. It's just damn web traffic, okay? Your, mm -hmm. I, your identity is layer two to layer seven in security for the cloud. It is the identity that matters. And then, so it says... Identity doesn't stop at just authentication. And I, you know, and, and Jason is nice enough to point out a lot of my patents are on 2FA. Love 2FA. It's great. Yeah. I use it everywhere. We and, and you know it's part of it's part of the uh, practices and procedures. So you're doing it stuff. Okay, guys, but look up anything on the web, any authentication, and I can show you a way that that eventually you can get around with. It. That's not picking on the 2FA, that's just reality. Okay, yeah. so if you can eventually get around any authentication, though TFA makes it hard, what do we got to do? How to do is, as Jason pointed out, NIST PRAC 6, principle of least privilege. So they get Garrett's account. Okay, does Garrett need to have access to everything? Right? right. And right. let's throw an idea out there, uh, uh, Jason. And shouldn't there be a little concept of a little bit of zero trust there? Right, mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. know, if I got on at this level of authentication, right, and yeah, maybe I can see some stuff, right, but then I'm going to try to get into this or this or this. Shouldn't there be different letters, layers of the second A authorization, right? Yeah. Where I say, hey, you know, you got on with what? You got on with your Android phone at you know two in the morning from some location ever known. Fine, I'll let you look at your email, right? But now you're getting over to this system and this, this. Okay, that's where you know the concepts of zero trust and and zero trust does not exist. Does not exist. I'll literally aid me in an airport. It doesn't exist without identity. There is. It just doesn't make any sense to anyone that you're going to say I'm going to quantify my network. I'm going to quantify my resources, and I'm not going to force identity. <laughs> oh, right. That's. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's my uh, no, rant for today. I, no, and I well, I, 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 this is why we're here. I think this is important for people to hear and and to talk and hear us talk through. Um, and I think that brings up that ne this last topic here on the slide is really about having you know with the, the identities each user each employee needs to have a unique uh, login. And some of your users, you may want to think about having more than one login because. You don't want somebody with admin access doing their general day-to-day -day work with an admin account with that kind of access. That should be used for maybe for specialty, for auditing, or for specific uh, administrative tasks. And then they log in with a regular user account for their specific work that they're doing that day. Yeah, I'm kind of laughing over here because Garrett and I were just at a show and we I'm had just a, of that, Ashley. Yeah, we had someone come up to our booth and he was talking about a certain department, they all have the same password. And he's like, so, you know, there's a lot of turnover. So what can you do to help prevent that? And Garrett and I are looking at each other like, I mean, why are you giving everyone the same password? I mean. The same ID, the same password. They literally a shared password on one account and he's given it to all his contractors for access to an wow. ICS, okay? Uh, critical infrastructure, okay? Wow. Uh, and I'm like, okay, that does violate slightly NIST PRAC-1, which is the issuing of credentials should be unique, okay? Right. And, and this is where it gets fun, being the vendor. He's like, all right, so Garrett, um, how can I get around this? I'm like, well, you don't. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you use the wonderful tools of IAM to start um, issuing identities per individual. And it's uh, and, and 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 guys, I I, I do the metaphor I use. IAM uh, Identity and Access Management is good. It is. I mean, Azure AD, Okta, Jump Cloud. These tools are good. I mean, they got provisioning worked out. They've got identities worked out. I reference it as to the 1950s cars. And I'm not a car guy, but I grew up in the Midwest, so my brothers and father are all into cars. Okay, right. So we had big Cadillacs, big Buicks, and those wheels in the driveway. And those engines were amazing. Guys, look up 1950s. The brakes were drum brakes. They were killing everyone. They were just right. nuts. You had these World War II P-47 engines running down a road at 120 miles with drum brakes, okay? Mm -hmm. They were killing everyone. 
that's my metaphor for today in 2022. The mm -hmm. IM products are fantastic. You can, mm -hmm. you can deploy anything today immediately. That means you can get an identity out to it and you get there. Your governance tools are way behind, okay? They are the drum brakes of 2022. They are, we got to get some disc brakes. We got to get some cloud uh, integrations into these things so we can start identifying our identities and know what we're giving access to. Yeah, uh, it's interesting you you bring that up because it's you know we started with the mainframes and we went very decentralized and then we now have come almost full circle back with the uh, with the cloud providers and now we're sitting here saying you know it, it still horrifies me because we get this we get that question all the time because say uh, an insurance agent is working with a carrier and the carrier may maybe only gave them one identity to log in so they've got fifteen per, uh, different uh, producers logging in on the same identity to file claims and to do in and and whatnot with an insurance company and you're sitting here going how do you how do you one you know if that person ever leaves you've got to then go and make sure that you're changing those passwords but then you have to redistribute it and then how do you attribute work to somebody and then how are you making sure that's secure it's just it's mind-blowing that this that these uh processes still exist and and i love that analogy that 19 how do you revoke you know, the one guy out of the 15 yeah, because <laughs> you gave out fifteen identities with the same password, yeah. everyone, and then you want to get one guy to do. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So that's that, that's great. So, um, and I think even we've been talking about this, and like who? I think one of the 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 important questions is who's allowed to assign access, and who's double checking that person who's assigning access is doing it properly. You know that they are. So we, you know, it's not just you know having somebody that you trust. Because, you know, people make mistakes, whether, you know, maliciously or, you know, it's a mistake that happens. Um, so you need to have some some ideas about how are you double checking that. And I think that's one of the nice things about your guys' tool is I've been looking around as you can see who's been auditing and you can see who's been, you know, you can assign different uh, ways to look and say, okay, what access does this person have and who's, who verified that this person should have this access, which I think is one of the beautiful things about your guys' tool um as, as we've been looking at that so um but really you know thinking about how do you assign that access and then the password policy i mean that's that's you know that's like early 20 you know 2000 i feel like i, I can't believe in 2022 i'm still talking about password policies with people but uh i heard this great comedian the other day and he was talking about you know when when we had to have difficult passwords we were like you know, we started with password and then he's like, and then you had to add a number. So everybody put a one at the end of it. So it was password one. And then he's like, and then we had to put a special character. So it became password one with an exclamation point. And, you know, and then we had to have a uppercase. It was capital P on the password with the one and an exclamation. And it's, you know, things like that that still exist in this world. I think there's still, you know. And did you raise your hand and say, can I tell you about man in the browser and man in the middle attacks? Oh, please, please. <laughs> it's all good. That's what I always love. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Happiness. That's the security guy. That's why no one invites the security guys to parties. There you go. <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, it, it fast. It, it's crazy out there. And this two-factor authentication. I love that you're you've got the, some your patents around there. Your 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 um, workers around the two-factor authentication side of things, because I I harp on this in every webinar, and everybody who's been here is probably you know saying I've heard Jason say this for the last you know ten years. The two-factor authentication is your best friend. Um, it's not perfect, yeah, but it's it's needed. You got it straight out. You know, I mean, y'all. Here's a, here's a little number that you can remember. It costs to get a user ID password one to three cents. So the whole cyber cage is uh, a cyber kill chain. Is is this right? You do. You say you really do want to get anthem. I'm not gonna pick on them, but they're they're great. They're you know, whatever. Anyways, but I just sent up there. You want to get an anthem. So what you do is you go, I say, I want to get an anthem. And I go, I want to get some user accounts because they're cheap, right? And they go online and they say, I want this user account. You do your reconnaissance and you get that you get that ID for, for a couple of pennies, okay? Why do they go to your user accounts? And this is why user accounts are so important because they're cheap. You know what it should cost for an admin account online in, in the, in the uh, dark web? Usually anywhere from $20 to $500, if not more. Wow. So what okay. they try to do is steal the easy ones because they can get them right. Someone's mm -hmm. always doing a hack against you know some you know low level employee into that, 
And then what they do is when they get the user count, they see what they get on, and then they execute the CFEs to uh, CVEs to see what kind of vulnerabilities on to escalate the privileges. It's cheaper to do that than to find the admin privileges straight out. That's why it's so ludicrously important to, as Jason said, first of all, get two factor all across the board. It just makes sense, right? And then secondly, do access reviews on what your regular users have access to, because there's a there's a study by Palo Alto that says 99% of cloud permissions are overly permissive. That's not Garrick Rajek saying that. That's Palo Alto Unit 42. It says in their survey, in like 6,500 uh, company uh, survey, and found out that that cloud permissions are ludicrously over permission. And we started the call intelligently saying. Your only control in the cloud in the cloud to start with is your identity. And now now when you know how it is, so how, how do we rectify that? We have to understand what we gave privileges to. Okay. So talk uh, and this is one of the things I like to talk to people about two-factor authentication, because not all two factors are created equal. Um, you know, we have you you can have an uh two-factor authentication code sent to your email, which if a device or uh, an identity has been compromised, you can almost assume that that email is compromised also. So while it's okay, it's not necessarily your, your best option, but better options might be, uh, a better option would be text, even better might be an application like a Google Authenticator, and then probably your best option would be a key um, that you would plug into your, like a USB key or something like that, or a, 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 a third party device. Um, the only problem with that last one is um, it's easy to lose it. Um, so it's, uh, you have to have some backup, you have to have your backup uh, codes for that, but just something to think about also. Yeah, and, and, but we would say that that first step is such a huge one. And we all know that the, 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 uh, the world no longer wants us to use SMS. They just don't because there, that's there's a, a couple of real good use cases recently. People, you know, uh, but I, I love Google Authenticator. I mean, and I love Microsoft Authenticator and Octo Authenticator. They're all good. And push authentication is 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 pretty decent. Um, I I would go back to where I'm. My brain is that on this stuff. It's got to be zero trust, guys. It's got to be you, you. It's okay to get on. Even if you get on with username and password, it's okay. But then quantify your users, and that's in the third step of architecture, the five step of architecture is zero trust. Quantify your users and say, okay, I've authorized this user to get this level access. Now he can get on here at this at this resource, but if he goes to these other resources, we got to get some step up. And yeah, maybe it is you know, a, a YubiKey or something like that, um, uh, mm -hmm. that type of uh, thing, or better yet, X509. So you can actually ensure that we're not being man in the middle or man of the browser attack, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. where, once again, authentication is a combination of of the functionality, but a, a times what the authorization abilities are. And it shouldn't be one size fits all, right? In our, in our good systems, going back as we reference, I love that we did. You know, back to the Rack F and the uh, and the mainframes, they did a real good job of that. Saying, okay, not only on the on the on the this is what they they did better than we are today in our current systems, because they did a real good job of, qu of quantifying not only the applications but the data. You're going to get to this data. I want to see this level of authentic authentication and authorization, and that's exactly how we have to be thinking of authentication in the cloud. We have to be thinking that I'm not only getting an app, but I'm getting data. And what level of permissions have I quantified for that data? And then how have I, uh, um, uh, uh, how have I authenticated that user? And for the auditors, y'all, you gotta show why you authorized, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And that's yeah. where Ashley does these quarterly meetings, right? And that's where we they just ask us, okay, what are you using for? And they always yeah. say. You know, we're using it for for groups, and we're using them to quantify to our, our resources. Mm -hmm. Great, right? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the difference here, and I think this is going to tie really nicely as we start when we get into some use cases for you guys, and we start talking a little bit more about uh, you attest and your tool um, about the difference between role based versus individual authorization. I know a lot of our 
our clients on the smaller side and tend to err on the side of going with individual authorization. So really thinking, you know, it's very, um, you know, basically we go in and you set a permission, you say, okay, this person, I'm going to grant them access to these files or to this or whatever. But when you get a little bit larger, it seems that it's not necessarily a, um, it may not be as advantageous because it takes a lot of work to sit there and say, I'm going to just, you know, I have to go through each program and figure out what I'm going to grant access to versus saying I've done roles instead. So uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the difference or, you know, what a role-based access might look like um, and why this is so important for organizations to implement. Yeah, sure. um, go for it. So we have one customer in particular, it's our biggest customer. Um, so they have, I think the exact number is 9,947 licenses, right? Wow. But they have 1,900 reviewers over 29 different countries. And as far as roles, it's half a million roles. Um, so roles are super important and that that's exactly why, before she was doing spreadsheets. So literally, I mean, talk about not doing her day job, like this was her day job, is just going through spreadsheets. Um, so roles become super important because of that. Um, you know, just because one person has one title, that doesn't necessarily mean they have one role. And we found that out kind of the hard way during their first audit. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll let Garrett go further on oh, that. I loved it. You, you said it, actually. That was great. Because roles is what is this, guys, going forward. Okay? And and I liked where you started that, Jason, where you started talking users. And I literally screamed now when my, or sir, someone is doing user-based access control. You're like, you can't. That's wrong. I mean, it's literally in the, in the day of what I call wrong or right, that's wrong. It doesn't It doesn't scale. It's not compliant. That's not coming from Derek Rajak. That's coming from my, my Uber source that I use, this guy Raj, and, uh, uh, that uh, did a bunch of audits, including the uh, 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 when BlackBerry got bought by uh, uh, bought Silence. And he's he goes, when he goes to account, all he does is look at, he goes, okay, so how did you quantify access? Where is the role? And the company says, oh, Bob goes in, he does this, and he adds these six users, and he got this. That's not compliant. That's just, that's not compliant. That's, that shows that you do not have the practices and procedures to make your company secure. And that comes back to, you know, minute number three of this, of this call. That's what gets cited when the fines come out. Mm -hmm. What were your mm -hmm. practices and procedures around the controls? Okay. Right. And if you're saying, well, Bob would add a guy when Jane asked him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, that's not it. If you say, okay, rock and roll, guys, I got it. They, they got to the PHI through this amazing new zero-day hack and all that kind of stuff. But this is what we had in place, y'all. We, 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 um, we had, what is Jason said, we put in the two-factor in, we had quantified the roles, and here is uh, this PR AC-1 showing where we, we uh, how we, how we provisioned it's AC-1, PRA-6, why we why we gave them limited access control this much, and then PRAC-4, which is our access review. And that's what you attest is the access review. And if you show that, then it's like, okay, I got it. Okay. PHI was the detain because no one knew that that amazing new you know, Android hack that went straight back over, back all the way to the mainframe and took every ounce of data back. We didn't know that, you know, zero day attack existed when we put this in place, but you had showed that you'd done the steps. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, and that that's important is showing, you know, a lot of times when, when going in to situations where, you know, like when we've gone through audits with, with uh, Health and Human Services, HHS, is showing that you have that policy that you enacted that and that you have that history it's not just did we do it now it's do you have that over time and so that's why it's important to have that and especially with that new safe harbor law that just was signed in right at the end of the trump administration where he said if you got hipaa compliance for a year before the your breach happens for oh you know a year or more that the fines are significantly reduced because you're showing at, you've shown that you've had made a good faith effort towards that compliance. So it's some of the things to think about is do you have documented again? I, I want to reinforce that is 
who has access and why do they have that access? Um, and then are you reviewing that access with frequency? I think that's actually one of the next question, next discussions we're gonna have is how often should companies be reviewing access controls? Look at that. Um, and so we wanna talk a little bit about periodically what that looks like um, and then you know what what kind of incidents can trigger this now i threw in we threw in a couple here about you know at a minimum quarterly i think you know that's you know outside if you've got any other issues or if there's been a change in staff i think that's a great opportunity to go through and do an audit and make sure you've got everything uh in place and that people don't have access that shouldn't have access uh especially um if you've got maybe changes in contractors coming through i think contractors are one a real big vulnerability we all need them uh, in our lives, in, in our in our uh, work lives, I guess. But um, do they really need the access and have you denied access? Uh, at, at, you know, and, and I know when dealing with this stuff, they like to put some time frames around that. I know that HIPAA is not as strict around that, but um, maybe we can talk a little bit about reviewing access controls. And again, I think this feeds really nicely into what you guys do with the um, over at UATest. Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so yeah. All users should be one time a year, at least. Admins, one mm -hmm. times a month. However, like Garrett said earlier, we do these QBRs with our customers, and we have some customers doing it monthly. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, you know, like you said on the slide, whenever there's a change in staff, we have one particular customer that has a call center, right? So we all know with call centers, there's, I mean, there's a change in staff almost every single day. So if they wait quarterly to do these access reviews, it's going to be a bear versus if we do this continuous compliance where it's monthly. I mean, some customers are excessive and even do it weekly just to ensure that you're always compliant. So when the auditor does come in, it's, it's not this huge mess. So that's how a lot of our customers are doing this. I love where you took that, actually, because she's a lot closer to customers than I am. So she gets the feedback and, and gets... Mm -hmm. Gets, gets Garrett, we, whatever. The concept right now, we uh, actually just did, and some team members did the IIA show down in uh, Florida, and everyone's talking about continual compliance because that's where we're at now. Continual compliance yeah. is implementing these best practices and procedures. And it comes out to how do we, I don't know, I don't know this is not where our brain works, you know, justify or whatever, where we, we message it as continuous compliance, but it's necessary. And it's actually stated these customers are changing the 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 ad modified deletes that are are just insane right now because of the uh, because of the contracting world and lack of w2 resources etc right we mm -hmm. are just modifying our user base by phenomenal amount that's never been done in the last 20 years so a lot of these guidances and best practices written yeah access reviews once a year no everyone in the industry knows that's not good enough we need automation right. tools that we can do this. There is no auditor I've talked to that hasn't told me that admins shouldn't be reviewed at least once a month, mm -hmm. okay? And because the real hackers, the, the ones I talked to in my background, know because user accounts are not throwaways because of zero day attacks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if yeah. you're looking at access privileges of, 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 a, of your user accounts once a year, that's nuts. It's got it. We right. got to get that to at least at least quarterly. And with automation, as Ashley said, you can get this down to once a month, right? With one risk manager, which a point percentage of one risk manager, but pushes buttons. There you yeah. go. Yes. No, that that's really great. So, um, I think Ashley, this feeds really nicely, and and one of the reasons we are talking. You sort of mentioned this, but. Um, I'd love to talk about, like, you attest what you guys are seeing in the field and some use cases that you guys have um, with, with your tool. Um, I think that would be great, a great lead in here. Like I stated before, um, a lot of our customers are just, they were just spending too much time doing these user access mm -hmm. reviews, right? I mean, there's no title. Someone applying for a job isn't applying for, you know, user access review professional, <laughs> right? It doesn't exist. So wow. you just helped me in like five marketing calls there. What is the title? And it's like, no, right? they, they, you know, they, they, they say that, you know, it's like, it actually knows it's not. Yeah. Right. And so using, you know, something that's more automated, it's letting them prevent these hacks that are constantly occurring. You know, 
they're, like we said, we're doing these quarterly, we're doing these monthly. So it's just helping them do what they signed up to do, what their job description says. Like it, it's just becoming so much of a bear that it just needs to be fixed and automated so people can do their real jobs. Yeah, and let me add on something there because when I started my career, I worked for a company called Security Dynamics. Big bonus round if anyone knows what Security Dynamics was. It, they were the first two-factor company. They had the two-factor uh, uh, tokens. So I was actually okay. like number six or whatever. They made so much money, so much money mm -hmm. selling those tokens that they bought RSA for the name. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's that's what Security Dynamics was, okay? Okay. But anyways, when I was out there selling those two-factor fobs and doing the integrating into Radius and all that kind of stuff, um, the uh, companies uh, uh, that were in regulations, and I had my little list out there, it's about 15 to 20%, you know? Sure, there was something around SOX if they were public or maybe they had something around HIPAA, but there weren't real fines. Now, actually, I get, I get on calls, it's about... 90% of the companies have some regulation, if not more. And elementary school, y'all, is under HIPAA, okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. that is keeping data on their users, right, that has can be mm -hmm. relevant to healthcare information is under HIPAA. So yeah. things have changed, right? And that's where Ashley is so right. The person that we're talking to doesn't have doesn't have a background in, in identity, let alone identity governance. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's he's he's, he's a, either a guy that's you know skilled in in uh, um, you know, many of the security guys are skilled still in the network world, right? And so they really are way behind the ball. If you say yeah. hey, you know it's good to spreadsheets and emails, it's not their forte, y'all. They're 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 playing out of position. They mm -hmm. need an automated tool that that they can use, like like. And I put the uh, um, things as, as Salesforce. If anyone ages themselves and, and knows what filling out, you know, uh, uh, sales sheets was before Salesforce, it was it was a nightmare. Okay. Yeah. And that's what needs to be done, and that's what we uh, we've done over here at U Attest around the concept of identities and access reviews. Is just simplify this, make it just something that is easy you know let's get rid of those drum breaks and and you know put something that actually you know allows risk managers whatever their their title is but they're acting as risk managers when they're quantifying the identities and quantifying the access that people have privileges to I, it's interesting because we run into this a lot is we you know, very talented it folks and not not saying anything against them but they just don't understand the regulatory frameworks that they're up against. Um, and that's the, that's the interesting thing. And that's one of the places where we come in, but I also see with you guys helping somebody go, oh, well that, okay, that makes sense that I have to do this. And then giving them a tool so they can actually move forward with that. Cause you're right, a spreadsheet, uh, I think we're about to talk about that here in this next, uh, this next. Let me add out of it, Jason. You take your average, very intelligent IT guy, I mean, they've Mm -hmm. Got through our schools, which is you know it, it is right, and you say, "Hey, define governance." <laughs> Look at you go. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, what do you mean? Uh, especially yeah. if they're a layer two to four guy, that means nothing. Yep. And they can even be an identity guy, and they won't mm -hmm. understand that governance is not about the act; it's about the why, and the proof and the evidence of the why. Okay, that's why an access review is called a recertification. And it's right. like, what was your process of recertifying? Yeah, nice, nice slide. Thanks. Yeah. So, and this is one of the things that goes back to the, you know, I, I doing it sort of, as we say, ad hoc or as, you know, as somebody comes in and you say, hey, Bob, I need to add a new person to my, uh, to, into my company without really thinking about, okay, what access does that person need? What, how should we be granting this access to somebody? So, um, you know, what is the cost of doing something like that ad hoc? I mean, I don't even know that's quantifiable. It just seems like a... I mean, yeah, like you said, it, I don't know if it's necessarily quantifiable, but I mean, it's it's a lot of time, right? And it's it's not even just, you know, if you get caught, the fines, it's more than that. It's it's the reputation of the company. You know, if, if you are a company that, you know, 
Bob was let go and then all of a sudden Bob got access or some other hacker got access to, you know, an account that no one removed access to, it's the, the whole reputation of the company goes down. Right. So it, again, it's more than just financial. And y'all, we remember what we uh, yeah, it was about uh, a year, a year and a half ago, what we did is UTS hired a CPA. And what they did is that CPA went out there and interviewed a bunch of our customers, a bunch of our prospects on how much time they were spending on these access reviews mm -hmm. and then how much time a cost saving an automation tool. Literally, just right. the V1 automation tool. We we uh we the, the spreadsheet showed an 80 to 90 percent. And what I was wrong is I thought, well, fine, you're gonna do these once a year, do you save this one? The the customers came back and said, Garrett, I'm doing these for socks, I'm doing these for sock two, I'm doing these for HIPAA, I'm doing this for a report that I have to do. Now we're in defense country, at CMMC, et cetera. I'm doing these eight to twelve times a year. And all we did is add a column in the spreadsheet that said eight. So y'all, if you're ever looking for uh, a justification for the tool, it, uh, our customers use that tool, use that spreadsheet. We just plug in the numbers and helps the CFO approve the budget. I mean, that that's an amazing, I, I, I'm just sitting here going, I can't, I, going through and doing a an audit like that and having a tool to help you save time like that is, is invaluable. Yeah. Um, and and I think even the cost, even so, even more so, and I might tee this up for you guys is, you know, we used to say a lot in the beginning is you don't know what you don't know. And it's these situations where if you're not doing the audits or you're just granting access ad hoc, as, we, as we're saying here, you may not know who has access to your systems and at what level. And that can be a major vulnerability. Again, as we were talking about, you know, and identity that's is the a the way way that's that's a recipe to hack and that's yep. how you find that's straight out they're not mm -hmm. that is they finds and I, I just did this whole presentation on uh, use cases in the healthcare industry the pharmacy industry and the defense industry and each one of them was fine not because they got hacked they got fined because they could not show that they had the practices and procedures around securing the data and the resources E.g., they were just sloppy, and that that is fine to be sloppy. It's not fine to be sloppy in a regulatory industry, right? Right, uh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So um, you know, and and I think we touched on this a fair amount here today. Is you know, you have some ways to review this uh, your access control. You know, you've got the spreadsheets. Pros and cons is we've all dealt with versionitis. You know, even if you get into Google Sheets, you're still like, who did this, when, and what? And you're going back into history, and it can be a real, real dicey way to do it versus having an automated software solution like a UATest. To, to help you I saw this. a report that came out from a vendor said that 60%, there was an auditor that said 60% of manual processes around identity at the station are error, have errors. Yeah. Because it just makes sense. You're not getting yeah. real time data. Your a spreadsheet passed. Everyone gets an email. I mean, mm -hmm. Ashley knows I'm the worst email reader in the world. I skim mm -hmm. them and then Ashley comes back and goes, Garrett, you didn't read that. I go, you're right. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's what goes on. That's why automation in this field is not just a luxury. It's it's mandatory because we have to know who has access. The hacks are from people gaining, anyone can gain an identity anywhere, and then doing escalating the privileges and then lateral movement across our enterprises. And that's where the hacks, that was just the Uber hack, y'all. That was just a, a kid grabbing an identity, a simple identity, right? And then what he did is do some lateral movement and, and showed the world that he can pull data. You know, mm -hmm. now whether I don't get on the side of whether he's a hero or a, a villain, but it's just doable. Right. I guess that sort of fits in that gray hat area. Is he, he depends on what he's doing with the data. Do you just say, I can do it? Or, yeah, did he go full so black the, hat? This guy he was sitting in Russia, Snowden, who might argue whether that's, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, not. not I was actually listening to a really interesting podcast around that. And it's like, I, it, and I understand one side of it, not to get too deeply philosophical about it. I understand one side of one of the hackers was saying, I tell people what's going on, but they don't listen. He said, the only way they listen is when I publish the hack. And I say, now you're on a clock because all every hacker is out there is going to pick it up and go for it. So I basically put you on notice. So it's like, 
uh, I don't know. I mean, I, see, I guess I see some of that in, on some well, sides, but yeah. Having done it at a company mm -hmm. that me and Ashley was working at, where you publish how you can hack someone, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now whether you want to argue or not, it's, it should be, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It is illegal. It is yeah. illegal to, to quantify and to show the world how to do uh, hack someone else's enterprise. So I, and that should be in my opinion, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. I, you know, things get done, you know? Yeah, no, no, no and, and I, I agree. And that's one of those situations of, I, I, I guess I can see the other side of it, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I, I yeah. But um, it's just one of those things about this. I think we should stick to access control and just make sure that you're really keeping tabs on who's got access in your in your company, what they have access to, and why they have access to it. I think that's the big takeaway for today. And you, um, you hear another access control that they cause. I don't know why they don't, but they don't relate it to what's really going on. Because I mm -hmm. did a lot of work at Cisco and in companies like Silence. Zero day hacks are used to take our identities and cause more damage. And the two are really tightly coupled. And if you're yeah. not doing access reviews and you don't understand what you give access even to all your accounts, not just your admin accounts, you're in a you're in a world of hurt. Because they can, they will escalate the privileges and they will move around your enterprise and steal data. Right. For sure. So um Harris, I think we've got may have a couple questions here. Yeah. Hey, Jason. Um, hey. I will read out the first one for you. Great. We've got um, somebody asks, who should be reviewing access controls? Should it be your compliance team or just your privacy officer? Start with the real world, Ashley. Yes, <laughs> you know. I mean, usually it's the risk manager, right? It's the risk manager who's reviewing access, but it depends. Every business is set up differently, especially depending on size. Um, mm -hmm. But more often than not, it's it's the risk manager. The smaller companies, it's it's usually the CISO, um, but the bigger is usually the risk manager. Yeah, and the risk manager, in theory, and you know, recommended from you know others that should fall under like the CFO group. Right, they're not part of IT, but Ashley knows that's not reality. <laughs> it's not. So how do you how do you justify that we don't have the IT competence in the CFA group to actually do an identity review? We just don't. And it's, it's almost most of them don't. Right, and then right. the IT competence is in the IT group, who by should be the last person in the world doing the audit. Okay, mm -hmm. because that's you know that's come on. I mean, people better at better at metaphors help me there, but uh, you know whatever. I'm just kidding. Is 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 you know the, the fox in the hen house? But the whole concept there is what we have to do, and this is what we did at UATest, and we're, we're all products should be a test. Is that the person who's doing the review actually does no reviewing at all? He just pushes a button and pushes out the reviews to the people. And that's why we've been successful and Ashley's been successful with both the people in the IT group and the CFO group, because they love this tool because it connects to the identity stores and then pushes out the reviews. And, and the person who ran it says, hey, I'm Bob. I didn't run this review. I had Ann, Dan, John, Monique, and they ran the reviews and I collated them. And that's mm -hmm. what real reviews are done. So yeah, yeah. The, the theory, it should be under the, the CFA group, and that's what I've been told. In reality, it's done by anyone who's willing to do the work and get the report collated and into the uh, audit uh, report. But if it's done correctly, the auditors don't object. Right, right. Well, and I think that's, uh, you know, in these situations, we have uh, a lot of people who have to deal with the, deal with the size or the structure of the company that they're, that they're dealt. Um, and so these audits still need to happen, but it's happening within a, a structure of making, as you said, making sure it gets done. So um, is, is that, you know, that might include bringing in an IT contractor to help with those situations to help make sure that things are happening. But I like that you brought up that it needs to be somebody outside of IT um, because it's kind of like, it you really, know, 
I, yes. Yeah. I, it does, it's just the, 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 and, and the honor is getting certain. They have, look what's going on with CMMC. Whatever. They were saying, guys, these are not audits. These are just some from IT said, I did my job good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and and you're asking somebody to if you give it back to the you know the, your your ISO who just set everything up, they're basically auditing themselves. And you know it's like it's like reading your own paper. You know when you read an article that you wrote, you you skim it, and you need somebody who's going to look at it and say, um, you know, you're why are you using past tense here, or why are you doing this, or this isn't this isn't a good sentence. Like you need somebody who's actually going to really read. Or really go through and audit what's happening and go okay well why does ashley have the access that she has that we granted her you know what what's going on here and you know what's going on with this account or you know that that's those are the kinds of questions and so it's helpful to have a third party or somebody who's not necessarily in the day-to-day -to, -day to, to look at it and start asking questions so um that's great all right well we got just about two more minutes here um harris do we have any other questions that have come in Sure. Yeah. Another one we got is how many different access roles should there be for a small company with five to ten people? Uh, yeah. I, I, you want to start with that one, or I, I can start. I, I'll, I'll defer to you right away. I mean, I okay. think. Yeah. That's uh, really hard to answer in the sense of uh, uh, of you know what is the what is the date always goes back to as, as Jason started in, in, in whatever his first slide about HIPAA always goes back to the data right now what what are you holding right if you're yeah. holding if you're holding uh, healthcare information and and it have I have this things and this is whatever then you, it, it, go classify your data and see if it can be classified in a single group and then figure out which users are there and then figure out what apps have access to it, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and then you say, but Garrett, this guy's a sales guy. He he should have access to this app and that app, right? If your data is pretty uniformed and that's really just a couple of, of, of people, maybe two people have access to the actual data that falls under PHI or PII, and then you have sales and marketing and the, those type of people that have nothing to do with that data. Yeah, I think you can have a pretty, simple uh, roles, pretty simple. Some are probably between, you know, five to, to 15 roles. Now, if your data is complicated and you're, uh, and we have small companies we work with and their data is complicated because basically what they are is a brokerage of data, right? And then you want to quantify those roles to, to, uh, uh, to the users because what often happens in that type of stuff with complicated data is, is you have a lot of uh, RBAC going on where not just your employees, but your contractors and your partners have access to data. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the long and short of it is, is that it really depends. You know, it depends on how much, you know, how, how flat your structure is. Uh, you know, I know some places uh, that we work, that we work with are fairly flat that they have maybe a five people and they all need access to the same information but that doesn't mean they need admin access to to all you know as far as uh you know access so some things to think about along those lines um but i i really want to thank everybody for coming out today um if you have any further questions uh please feel free to reach out to us at info at totalhippo.com or at the 800 number here also um garrett and ashley over at you attest we really appreciate you guys coming please go and visit them um, we will be sharing this recording around, but thank you so much, uh, guys. Really appreciate your time today, and this was a lot of fun. So That was a lot of fun. That hour went quick. Thanks. Yeah, it did. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for thank joining us. Thank you for us. having us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.